God created us spirit, soul, and body. These three areas are interrelated. What goes on in one affects the others. This message is the first in the series, Rudders and Roots. The message is entitled, Turning Your Life Around. Here is Pastor Dale O'Shields. Start a new series of messages that I'm actually very excited about. Uh, the message series I'm going to be sharing with you, as far as I know, I've never preached a series uh, on this particular topic uh, in my entire ministry. I've preached around it and talked about the topic from various angles at times, but we've never dedicated a specific uh, focus to the idea of your words. I want to talk to you for the next several weeks about changing your words and changing your life, the power of your words. Now, I would like to say something as we begin today. Uh, any, any concept that you get from God's Word requires oftentimes sort of a saturation. You don't usually get it just from the first exposure to it. And so it, there's an ongoing process of learning that you need. And that's why I really, really want to encourage you as we start this new year together that you'll make the decision to be in church every weekend. I promise you that when you show up to church, the Bible says, God says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And one of the ways that we draw near to God is by being in His house. And so I really want to encourage you as we start 2019 just to make the decision. I'm going to be in church every week unless I'm sick or I can't make it because of other extenuating circumstances. I'm going to be in the house of God and especially for this series because we want to get saturated in this truth I believe is going to change our lives. We're into a brand new year. With every brand new year provides tremendous momentum and opportunity for making changes in our life. That's why we have things called New Year's resolutions. We're talking about what we want to be different in the year to come, the next 12 months. And so there are many resolutions that have been made, many decisions that people are making about their life. It really is a wonderful time to set your life in a new direction, to set a new course for your life. And I want to talk to you about setting a new course in a particular area of your life, the words of your mouth, what you speak, the kind of words that you use. We're going to be talking about how we adjust the words of our life because our life actually moves in the direction of our words. Whether we realize it or not, how we speak determines quite often how we end up living. There's a tremendous verse of Scripture in the book of Proverbs. Perhaps you've heard it before. I'm sure that many of us have. I'm going to invite you to look at it with me again today in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. I'm going to be reading from the, uh, from the Amplified Version. And I want us to note this very powerful statement that God gives us about our words. Notice this. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those who love it and indulge it will eat its fruit and bear the consequences of their words. Notice this. Death and life... They're in the power of your tongue. That is, when you speak, you have the ability to sow seeds that produce death or seeds that produce life, and you must understand that the seeds that you sow, you're going to reap the consequences of in life. What you sow is what you reap. And so if you sow seeds of death, death will be in your life, sow seeds of life, life will be around you, and our tongue is the sower of seeds. We are sowing death or we are sowing life. We eat the fruit of our words. Your words are powerful. There are many people today, perhaps in this worship center, in the various campuses where we've gathered today, there are many people that you're actually suffering in your life right now because of the words that you're speaking. Some folks sabotage their future by their words. I'll never be able to. I'm never going to accomplish that. I could never do that. I can't do that. All these words sabotage our future. There are people who are enslaving themselves to their past. I'll never get beyond this. This is going to hurt me for the rest of my life. Words like this will trap you. Many times we depress our own soul by our words. Have you ever talked yourself into discouragement? There have been many times that in the self-talk of your life, you've talked yourself down to a moment of deep discouragement. You reinforce destructive spiritual strongholds in your life. And certainly you and I can diminish or destroy our relationships by the words that we speak. And if you and I want to be free from our past and joyous today and get on track with God's plan for our future, overcome spiritual strongholds, improve relationships, we have to work on our words. I want you to say with me this morning, I need to work on my words. Say it together. I need to work on my words. I want to digress just for a moment with a bit of a caveat. As I go through this series, this, this season together, I'm going to talk a lot, obviously, about our words and how we speak, but I don't want you to misunderstand. I'm not saying that you can call everything in life into existence just by speaking it. I'm not, 
I'm not into a theology that's often referred to as sort of the name it and claim it theology, that whatever you name, you get in your life. No, you're not. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about adjusting your words so that you are in agreement with God, so that you're speaking things that are consistent with what God says about you, that your words are consistent with the truth of his word and consistent with the promises of his word. I'm not talking about some kind of set of magical incantations that you go around spouting and thinking that your world's going to get better just because you use magical terms. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about bringing your words in line with the Word of God, the promises of God's Word. And today what I want to do for you, we're going to look at this series, and this series is going to be somewhere between seven and eight, eight weeks, I, I'm anticipating. Uh, but I want to lay a foundation for you today. I want to give you four facts that you need to be aware of that are foundational that will help us to get started on this journey together, that will help us to understand the power that our words possess. The first thing I'd like to talk about just briefly this morning is that your thoughts and your words shape your life. Your thoughts and your words shape your life. To understand how God works in your life, you have to understand how God made you, how God designed you. You can't understand how he works if you don't understand something about you. So let me stop for a moment and describe how God made you. God created you and I with three basic parts. You can't really pull them apart and divide them necessarily, but we're, we're made of three dimensions. We're a three-dimensional being, spirit, soul, and body. Say it with me, spirit, soul, and body. You're not just a body walking around, though. No, you do have a physical body that you're very aware of, but inside of you is something more than that. There's a spirit in you. There's a soul in you that's given by God. Now, that spirit, when you enter into the world, when you're born into the world, the spirit in you is not yet alive. It's not alive because we're living under the curse of sin. The Bible says we're dead in our transgressions and in our sins. And so when you and I come into faith in Christ, when we come to the point of realizing we're dead in our sin, we need a living Savior to bring life to us. We put our faith in Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, and we are born again, that there's the life of God, birth is birthed in us, and we, we become alive. The life of Jesus causes us to experience life, and our spirit comes alive unto God. We now have a relationship with God. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so when we accept Christ, life comes to our spirit. We're born again. Jesus was having a conversation with a man one day by the name of Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a really good man. He was a man that was morally good. He was doing a lot of things right. He was a very religious man. In fact, he was one of the Pharisees, a very significant, spiritually developed man from the standpoint of his understanding of theology. But Jesus has this conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 7. Notice his words, you should not. He says to Nicodemus, you should not be surprised at my saying. What is the statement there? You must be born again. He didn't say, Nicodemus, it would be nice if you were born again. He said, if you want to have a relationship with God, this is a necessity in your life. And what I will tell you today is if you want a relationship with God, you need to be born again. You need a relationship with Christ where you come to the place of realizing that you're dead yourself, you need a life with God, and you invite Jesus into your life, and there's this moment that your spirit is made alive in Christ. If you haven't done that, you can do that today. You can leave this place a brand new creation in Jesus. But once our spirit is alive, then... As Christ has come into our life, God begins his work in our soul and in our body, okay? Because our, our soul still needs a lot of help. Because our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And so as soon as you accept Christ, you're not perfect. You have, your life hasn't now become perfect. It's now you, you have God in you so he can begin to work on the way you think and the way you make choices and the feelings that go along with your life. And so he begins to sanctify your soul or work in your soul, change you on the inside. He begins to change your body. That is what you do with your body, how you live your life, how you walk and talk and live. And so Jesus is alive in your spirit. But your soul and your body still have a lot of destructive, sinful things that need to be addressed. Now, this is important when it comes to our, our speech, our words. Because what you speak, although it's a part of your body, all these three elements, spirit, soul, and body, are interrelated. So what you speak with your body affects what you feel in your soul. Are you hearing me this morning? What you speak you think about what you think about, you speak, what you speak, and you think about, you do. You see the interrelationship here? So I can start talking about something, and before I start, and once I've started talking about it, I talk myself into an emotion. You ever had that happen before? You were doing fine until you had a conversation with somebody. 
You had this conversation with him. You started talking. The more you talked, everything revved up inside. Before long, you got all these emotions going on inside of you that are negative emotions because you engaged in a conversation. Your words affected your soul. The same is true that in your soul that you begin to think certain thoughts. If you think them long enough, you start talking them. You begin to communicate about them. And what you think and what you speak ends up designing and directing how you live your life. And so your thoughts and your words shape your life. That's why the psalmist David prayed this very important prayer that I want us to read together. All of our campuses this morning, Psalm chapter 19, verse number 14. It's going to be on the screen. So would you read aloud and loudly with me this tremendous prayer? Let's read it. May the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Notice what David prayed. He said, God, I'm concerned about my words, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. Notice the words and the thinking that go together. The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart. I'm asking that they would be pleasing in your sight. Let's talk about that word pleasing for a moment. I think all of us here today would say, I want to be pleasing to God, right? I don't think you'd be in church this morning if you didn't have a desire to please God. I know that's in your heart. You want to please him. To please God is not just a matter of not doing bad things. Pleasing God is also about doing good things, correct? Correct. You don't just please God by avoiding the bad. You please God by learning how to do the good. And the same is true when it comes to the words of your mouth and the meditations of your heart. It's not just a matter of getting the bad words out of your life or the bad thoughts out of your life. It's also about bringing the good words into your life and the good thoughts into your life. That's how you please God. There's a prophet in the Old Testament that had to learn this lesson. Actually, most of the prophets had to learn it, but I want to draw your attention to one particular prophet. His name is Jeremiah. Give you a little history on Jeremiah. Jeremiah was called to be a prophet to the southern kingdom of Israel after the northern kingdom had gone into Assyrian captivity. And so the southern kingdom of Judah, at this point in time, they're now going through idolatry. Some evil kings are happening for them, and they're not really following God very well. And so God raises up Jeremiah the prophet to tell them, if you don't turn around, what's going to happen is you're going to be just like the northern kingdom. You're going to be taken into captivity by the Babylonians for 70 years. So he's this prophet that is raised up to to try to rescue Judah before they go into captivity because of their sin and idolatry. And when God calls Jeremiah, most theologians agree, based upon the study and history and so forth, that Jeremiah was a very young man, more than likely somewhere between 19 and 21 years of age. Now think about this for a moment. God calls him when he's 19, 20, 21 years of age, and he says, I'm going to call you to go and speak to kings and prophesy to a nation, and I want you to go and speak my word to this, 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 this nation that's about to get themselves into major trouble, and Jeremiah, I've chosen you to be my mouthpiece. Now, of course, at that young age, Jeremiah felt very intimidated. And so let's take a look now at Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Let me draw your attention to this interaction that Jeremiah has with God. Jeremiah is describing his calling to ministry. He says, the Lord said to me. So God spoke to me. This is what God said to Jeremiah. I knew you before you were formed within your mother's womb. Before you were born, I sanctified you and appointed you as my spokesman to the world. God says, Jeremiah, before you were even born... Before you were conceived in your mother's womb, I knew you, and I've called you to be a prophet to the nations. I've called you to speak my word. Now, by the way, I'll I'll step off with a digression just for a moment. This verse, verse 5 of Jeremiah chapter 1, is one of the most powerful verses in the entire Bible that emphasizes the sanctity of life. The life begins at conception. The Bible says here that God knew Jeremiah when he, before he was even formed in his mother's womb. We ought to honor life. Amen? Life is, is a gift from God, okay? Don't ever let anything else. This is, this, is not, this is not a political statement. This is a biblical statement, okay? It's all about the fact that life is, God is the giver of life, and life begins at conception. So that's just free for you today. I'm not going to even charge you for that, all right? Okay? So here's this moment. They have this interaction. God says, Jeremiah, before your mother even formed you, you were formed in your mother's womb. I knew you. I called you. And I want you to see how Jeremiah responds to this. Oh, Lord God, I said. What did he say? What did he say? I can't do that. I'm far too young. I'm only a youth. So you got this? God says, Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I called you. You're going to be a prophet to the nations. And Jeremiah, the first words out of his mouth, what were they? I can't do that. I'm too young. 
There's no way I can do that. So are you seeing that the scripture is emphasizing what Jeremiah said? It's telling us what Jeremiah said. It's revealing words coming from Jeremiah. Now notice verse 7, the first three words. Now this is God's response back after Jeremiah said, I can't do that. I'm far too young. I'm only a youth. What did God say in reply? Read it with me. Come on, church. What did he say? When you're talking to your kids, how do you say that? Don't say that. He said, Jeremiah, don't say that. Don't say that you're too young. Don't say that you can't do that. Don't say, stop talking that way. Stop talking that way. In other words, God says, you're going to mess up your whole future. You're going to mess up your whole destiny by your words. Your words are powerful. In your, in your tongue is the power of life and death. God says, don't say that, he replied, for you will go wherever I send you and speak whatever I tell you, and don't be afraid. There you see the connection between the words and the emotions, and don't be afraid of the people, for I, the Lord, will be with you and see you through. Here, folks, is what I want you to hear this year in your own life. I hope that from time to time in your day, you hear, you'll hear God whispering to you, if not shouting you, don't say that. There's some things you need to stop saying, amen? Some things you need to change because there's power in your words. And so we see that this was a moment in Jeremiah's life and moments in our life as well. The second thing I want you to see this morning foundationally as we start this series together is that your words are the rudder of your destiny. I'll give you a moment to write that down because I'm going to ask you a question after you've written that down. I'd like to have your, your attention toward me once you've written it down if you just simply look this way. Where do you want your life to be? Where do you want your life to be in the next 5, 10, or 15 years, 20 years? I'm not talking about where do you want to be physically or geographically or I'm not even talking about where you want to be professionally or occupationally. I'm talking about you as a person. What kind of person do you want to be 5 years from now and 10 years from now, 1 year from now for that matter? What kind of person? Have you ever stopped to think about what kind of person you really want to be? And what I want you to understand today, and this is the biblical truth that I'm trying to get across to us in this series, is that the words you choose, the words that you speak, are setting you in the course for your future and the person that you will actually become, the kind of person that you will be. The Bible says that your choice of words is, are highly responsible for where you end up in life. You say, are you sure, Pastor? I'm not sure that our words are that powerful. Yes, they are. Notice James chapter 3, verses 2 through 8. I want you to listen to this from the Passion Translation. We all fail in many areas, but especially with our words. Yet if we were able to bridle the words, if, yet if we were able to bridle the words, we say we are powerful enough to control ourselves in every way. And that means our character is mature and fully developed. So James says, we, we fail all the time, but most of the time... Our failure is related to our words. We fail more with our words, perhaps, than any other thing. Then verse 3, horses have bits and bridles in their mouths so that we can control and guide their large body. Anyone that's ever been on a horse, you understand this. Horses are massive animals. I mean, muscle upon muscle. I mean, just, just strong creatures of God. And when you get on a horse to ride a horse, there's a bridle that is attached to that horse's head, and there's a bit that's placed in the horse's mouth, and reins that are given to you, and a well-trained horse... All you have to do is just lightly pull on the rein one way or another, and the bit tells the horse, turn this way. It's controlling the mouth. Everything of that animal is controlled by its what? All that power, all that energy, all those muscles are directed by a bit in the horse's what? Mouth. Are you seeing the importance of the mouth? Let's pick up now the story continuing here. Verse 4. Because he shifts analogies here. And the same with mighty ships. Though they are massive and dri driven by, by fierce winds, yet they are steered by a tiny rudder at the direction of the person at the helm. And so the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it carries great power. Let me stop there. So he says, let me shift analogies for you. If you didn't get the horse thing, let me talk to you about ships. Okay? If you didn't understand the horse thing, maybe you've never been on a horse, but let me talk to you about ships now, boats. Boats are directed by a rudder. If you've ever been on a boat, you understand or looked at a boat, any kind of boat has some kind of small element that causes that boat to be turned. It's called a rudder. And when the, when the rudder of that boat turns, a small little thing on the bottom of the boat, when it turns one direction, the boat goes one way. You turn it another way, the boat goes in another direction. And so, again, the emphasis on both of these, is something small controls something big. You got it? So, small bit controls a horse. 
Small rudder controls a boat. So it's something small that controls something very, very large. Let's continue on verse 5. Just think of how, how a small flame can set a huge forest ablaze. So now he's given another illustration of a spark or a flame. And the tongue is a fire. It can be compared to the sum total of wickedness and is the most dangerous part of our human body. You know what the most dangerous thing in your body is? Not your hands, not even your mind, not even your, your, your feet. Your most dangerous element of your body is that thing that sits in the middle of your face that wags at people around you, that has all the bacteria associated with it. It's called your tongue. It's the most dangerous thing in your body. It corrupts the entire body as a hellish flame. It releases a fire that can burn throughout the course of human existence. For every wild animal on earth, including birds, creeping reptiles, and creatures of the sea and land, have all been overpowered and tamed by humans. But the tongue is not able to be tamed. It is a fickle, unrestrained evil that spews out words full of toxic poison. So even James says, you can't control this thing by yourself. You're going to need supernatural power to control it. That's why you and I need our spirits alive in Christ and God working in our soul and our body through His grace and power and His Spirit to even bring this thing under control. But let's talk about this, this bridle. Let's talk about this rudder for a moment. Let me go to the rudder illustration. I'm going to pick up on this. Every boat, every ship to move forward has to have propulsion. Okay. That propulsion, if you have a, a, just a, a motorcraft, just a, a, a motorcraft that you use for like skiing or those kind of things, many times they're inboard motors, and so they have sort of a jet propulsion associated with them. Others are outboard motors, have propellers associated with but there's something that propels them forward. It gives them power to move forward. A sailboat, the wind is the propulsion factor, but you can't move a boat without some kind of energy, some kind of propulsion, okay? But you also have to have, to have something that provides direction to the power. There are many people in life that have, they're, they're charged up, but their rudders aren't working, okay? And they're wondering why they're crashing their life over and over again. They crash marriages, they crash relationships, they crash jobs, they crash all kinds of things in life. They crash their future, they crash their relationship with their kids, they crash all kinds of things in their life because they've got the energy, they're moving, but there's no proper rudder or the rubber, rudder is directed in the wrong way. And so what's happening, the rudder is what? Your what is it? Your, your mouth, okay? And so you have to understand that you can have all the power in the world and be very excellent at whatever you do and powerful and strong and capable and all those things. But if your rudder is amiss, if your mouth is not working correctly, you're still going to crash. It's not going to be the kind, you're not going to get where you need to get. And so to get to your destiny in life, you not only need good propulsion, but you need a good rudder that sets your direction. And the Bible speaks of the fact that our words are actually setting the direction of our life, changing our course and changing our condition. Your mouth is taking you somewhere. Turn to your neighbor and tell them your mouth is taking you somewhere. Go ahead and tell them that. Your mouth is taking you somewhere, right? You guys didn't seem too excited about saying that. That's all right, okay. <laughs> Number three. Third fact today, when you change your words, you change your life. The key word there is the word Change. Two times in your notes here, you'll see that word change. When you change your word, you change your life. Change means to make different. It means to alter, to replace one thing with another, to make a shift, to have an exchange. Something happens that is different. I'll give you this analogy. If you're in a car at nighttime, the dark of night, and you're heading down a highway, and you're barreling down that highway, and you don't realize that as you get further down the highway, that you're going to get to a place where there was a bridge, but the bridge has been washed out, and there's flood water that's flowing through there, and you don't realize that it's there, but you're barreling down in the darkness. Would you appreciate someone flagging you down before you got to that point and saying, stop, turn around? Would you appreciate that? Of course you would. Of course you'd appreciate Oh, thank you so much for telling me that I need to turn around. I didn't realize I was headed toward a precipice. I was headed toward real danger. Well, this is why this series is so important, because God has an amazing destiny for you. God has an amazing purpose for your life. Every one of you here, every one of you here, God has an incredible purpose for your life. But so often, if our words are not correct, if we're speaking way, in ways that are inconsistent with God's word and God's promises and God's will, actually what's happening is we're barreling down through life and we don't realize we're about to crash somewhere. We're not headed toward the destiny that God has for us because we may have the energy, the propulsion, but we don't have the right direction. 
And so we need to make a change. And this series is all about how do we do that? How can we come to this point of turning things around? Jeremiah, again, the prophet in Jeremiah 7, verse 3, he speaks to Judah. They're headed down a pathway toward destruction. And God speaks and says, this is what the Lord of armies, the God of Israel says, change the way you live. Change the way you live. Change the way you act. And I will let you live in this place. God says you got to stop living a certain way. And if you'll change, then your life will be blessed. Your life will be a place of peace. So when you change your words, you change your life. Last point this morning I want to talk for a a few moments about is that when you you have a turned around life, it, it all starts with a transformed tongue. To have a turn around, to have this change, you have to transform your your talk. You can't transform your tongue. I want to talk for a moment about this idea of transformation, this idea of change and how it happens in your life. I think all of us since about probably the last week of December into the first week of January, and I'm sure you'll see it for the next couple of weeks as well, you've probably seen lots and lots of uh, commercials on television about weight loss. Anybody seen lots of those commercials, right? Okay. I mean, every diet in the world is out there now, okay? You got the keto diet and the non-keto diet and the, I don't know, the... All these other diets, you got everybody's promoting something, okay, out there in terms of how to lose weight, okay? Because everybody wants to make a decision this year about their, about their bodies, their weight loss, and those kind of things. All these commercials are there. But have you ever noticed that on these commercials that they always, they always have people telling you their story, right? Okay? And it's usually with some kind of imagery, and the imagery is, uh, first of all, them before they lose weight, okay? And then them, What? So before they lose weight, they're all crammed into these clothes, you know, everything's bulging out everywhere, okay? And then after they lose weight, they got all these big pants that they're holding up beside them like this, and you know, they're, they're standing in one leg of the pants, right? Okay, okay, it's like, right? You with me, right? Now, why do advertisers do that? Why do marketers give you a picture of before and after? Why? They're actually only doing what the Bible says. Without a vision, people perish. If you don't have a vision... If you can't see what you want to be, then you're never going to be it, okay? So change in life never happens just by, I'm going to get disciplined. You never wake up one day and say, I'm just going to lose weight. No. You wake up because you have a vision of what you want your life to be. The clothes you want to get into. There's a way you want to look. There's health that you want in your body. And so there's a vision that motivates you to discipline. Discipline never motivates you to vision. Vision motivates you to, to discipline. Are you hearing me? Okay. So you have to have a vision first before you're going to be disciplined enough to say no to some things that you need to say no to and yes to some things that you need to say yes to, but it starts with with a vision. And so what I want to do today is I want to give you a vision of what your life can be if you'll change, if you'll transform your words. Anybody ready for a vision this week? Something that you can carry with you that'll say, that's what I want to be. I want this to be my life. And so we're going to build this this idea of what a vision is for us as we move toward our future. And on your notes, you're going to see eight statements. I'm going to invite you to read them together with me. And let's take a look at the vision that God has for your life and the vision I believe that you want for your life as well. Let's just envision for a moment what your future could be. What if, read number one, what if the person, read with me aloud and loudly, what if the person you truly want to be as a follower of Jesus became a reality? What if? Just think with me for a moment. What if that person you really want to be as a follower of Jesus, you want to be strong and you want to be victorious and you want to be alive in Christ, you want to be used by God. I believe that you. What if that person that you want to be really became a reality? What if six months from now and a year from now or five years from now, you are way stronger than you are spiritually right now. You are the person. You're moving into that person that God wants you to be and that you really want to be. Number two, what if, read together with me, what if the fruit of the Holy Spirit became more of a norm in your life. Wouldn't that be a good thing? What is the fruit of the Spirit? Write down Galatians 5, 22. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All these are nine fruit of the Spirit that are listed there. I don't think I think I listed eight, but there are nine of them that are there. Nine fruit of the Spirit listed. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be awesome if you had more love in your life? Wouldn't it be awesome if you had more joy, more peace, and more patience, and kindness, and faithfulness, and goodness, and gentleness, and self-control? What if, just what if, you had a lot more of the fruit of the Spirit in your life than you have right now? Would that be a good thing? Would that be the kind of person you'd want to be? Come on, church, say amen, okay? 
That's, that, that's the vision, okay? That's who I want to be. I want to be a person that's, that's emanating the fruit of the Spirit in my life. It's flowing from me. It's who I am. There's more of that in my life. Number three, what if? Read together with me. What if? Read this one really loudly. Here you go. What if? Fewer things stressed and worried you. Would that be a good thing? Would it be a good thing if fewer things stressed you out and fewer things ever worried you? I'm going to bring this back to our words in a few moments, but would that be a good thing for you? Is that who you want to be? Somebody that is less worried and less stressed. Number four, what if, read together with me, your future was more promising and exciting than it has ever been in your life? Just what if you were looking towards your future and you thought, my goodness, I can't wait to get there because my future is so exciting. I can't wait for all that God's going to do. I believe that my best is not behind me. I believe that my best is in front of me. I'm going forward with enthusiasm into my future. What if you believe that, if that was really in your heart and really in your life? What if, what would that do to your life? Number five, what if, read together with me, what if past guilt, shame, and pain were healed and you were more wholesome, healthy, and whole? Would that be a good thing? Would it be a good thing if your, your guilt was gone and your shame was gone and your pain, your emotional pain was gone and you were more wholesome and healthy and whole? Would you like to be that person? Man, I'm preaching hard. You're not helping me out this morning. Come on, help me out, okay? Number six, read with me, what if? relationships in your life dramatically improved. Would that be a good thing? What if your marriage got better? Would that be good? What if your friendships got better? Would that be good? What if your relationships at work all got better? What if every relationship in your life improved over the next six months, the next year, the next five years? Would that be a good thing? Number seven, what if? Read with me your capacity and skills in every area of responsibility in your life increased. What if you got better at everything you do? Everything you do, you got better at. You got better being a dad. You got better being a mom. You got better being a husband. You got better being a wife. You got better in your job. You got better being a friend. That every part of you, you got better at doing everything that you do. People look and say, what happened to him? I don't know, but he sure got better. Would that be a good thing? See, this is what God wants for your life. Last one here. You ready? What if, read with me, what if you operated your life in faith rather than fear. Would that be a good thing? Just what if, okay? What if every day you woke up and you were living in faith and you weren't living in fear? What if when you face situations that the first response of your life was not fear, but the first response of your life was faith? Would that be a good thing? Let me ask you, what does this have to do with words? It has everything to do with your words. Because you need to begin to speak these things in your life. Begin to speak and say, I am going to become the person that God wants me to be. I'm going to be a strong believer in Jesus Christ. I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. Nothing will keep me. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. We begin to declare things like this. There's a declaration that my words are setting the course of my life. I set my rudder in a direction. Amen. I got the bit in my mouth. I'm going somewhere. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Whatever happens, I'm following Christ, okay? I'm going to be a strong follower of Jesus. And so your words begin to set the course. I'm going to be a man of love. I'm going to be a man of peace. I'm going to be a man of joy. I'm going to be a man of gentleness and faithfulness and kindness. I'm going to be a man of self-control. I'm going to be a man. You just fill in our lady, whatever your case might be. This is who I'm going to be. You begin to declare that this is the person that I'm, de- I'm determined to be in my life. Your words are setting the course of your destiny. I- I'm going to stop worrying about stuff because God is able to handle everything in my life. I'm not going to let these things stress me out anymore because God is bigger than every problem I have. I'm going to begin to speak into my life the confidence, the assurance of who God is. I'm sure He is capable and able of handling everything in my life. And so instead of living in fear and worry or worry and stress, my future is going to be great. I'm believing that what is before me is phenomenal, that God has plans for my life. I'm not going to live in my past any longer. I'm not going to let what has been determine what will be and what's going to be in 
in my life. The past guilt and shame is gone. That's in my past. My relationships are going to be better. I'm going to pour into my relationships love and kindness and gentleness and goodness. I'm going to pour my life into the relationships I have with other people. I'm going to get better at everything that I do. I'm going to study. I'm going to learn. I'm going to be teachable. I'm going to gain information. I'm going to be setting in the direction of saying, this is who I want to be. I'm going to get better at everything I do. Whatever I'm doing now, if it's this level, in a year from now, it's going to be at that level. In five years from now, it's going to be at that level because I'm going to get better at everything I do. Those are the words of my mouth. I'm setting my rudder. Are you hearing me today? I'm setting my rudder, okay? I'm setting the course of my life. I'm not going to live in fear because I have a God who has capability of handling everything and perfect love drives out fear from my life. God didn't give me the spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. So I'm going to walk in faith and confidence in who God is because I'm setting the rudder of my life, okay? Are you hearing me today? There's power in your tongue, the power of life and death in your tongue. I'm not talking about some phony, baloney, and magical thing. I'm talking about using your rudder, okay? To set the course of your life and say, this is, this is who I'm going to be. This is where I'm going with my life. I challenge you, are you ready to change? Are you ready to put a bit in your mouth? Are you ready to make the decision to say, God, I'm going to begin to adjust the rudder of my life. Because I know if I'll adjust the rudder of my life, I'll discover the purpose and, the, and experience the divine destiny that you've ordained for my life. Would you bow your heads together with me as we pray? Father, thank you so much for your word this morning. As we begin this year together, we want to set the rudder of our lives in the right direction. Lord, our tongue is our rudder. And I pray that something today that we've heard would resonate deep within us and stay with us, Father. I pray we would, over the next several weeks, build on this. I pray that there would be a momentum in our lives that would truly change the course of our lives, our destiny. I pray that the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart would be pleasing in your sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer, in Jesus' name. I would like to close today by giving you an opportunity to ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Right where you are, just simply bow your head with me, and I'm going to give you a prayer to pray, and you can simply speak this prayer out, whisper this prayer out, and from the sincerity of your heart, call upon God, and I promise you that He will hear and answer you. So let's pray together. Start by simply whispering the name Jesus. Let there come uh, from your heart just the declaration of His name. Say, Jesus, I know that, that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short with you. I'm sorry for all of my sins. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you are God's Son. I believe that you are the Savior of the world. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive today. Now pray these words. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Give me a new start in you. I commit my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer with me, I want to encourage you with a promise from God's Word that says that when we call upon God's name, we call upon the Son of God, there is salvation that comes to our lives. He changes us from the inside out, and you become a new creation. All things pass away. All things become new. And that's exactly what has happened to you today. Your next step really is to make sure that you get into a good Bible-believing church. And you begin to study God's Word, get God's Word in you, and to make sure that you get a copy of the Bible if you don't have one and begin to read it. Spend some time every day in prayer. And I would encourage you also to check out the resources on our website that will help you to get going in your relationship with Jesus. You can find them at church-redeemer.org. Get those into your hands. Get started in your new life with Jesus Christ. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you next time. If you've prayed with a pastor today and made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, we have some resources for you on our website. Just go to church-redeemer.org slash a new you. We pray that this message was a blessing to you.